Swain and Co. Podcasts. Hello and welcome to this, the Prison Law Podcast, uh, the first of, of many we would hope. Uh, this is a podcast brought to you uh, by the solicitors at Swain and Co. Um, and the focus of this and the aim of this podcast is to focus on the the burning issues in the field of prison law. I'd like to introduce my uh, co-host and also my friend and colleague, Mr. Dean Kingham, who will be known to many of you. He's uh, He's been shortlisted for this year's Legal Aid Lawyer of the Year. Um, and this comes on the back of years of hard work. And I'm sure you'll all recognise his name, having been involved in uh, a number of high profile cases. Dean is also uh, an APL committee member the Association of Prison Lawyers, uh, and he's their parole board lead. That's what we're going to be discussing today with our guest, Martin Jones. Dean, what can you tell us about our guest today? Well, before I do that, I think we should introduce yourself, John. John Turner, Association of Prison Lawyers Chairman for a significant number of years, now a Swain and Co. prison team member. John, like myself, will be known to many in, in the um, legal world. For a, a number of years, you've taken high profile cases and perhaps the most high profile was the case of Hutchinson versus the UK, which was a European Court of Human Rights challenge in respect of how the how England and Wales interprets compassionate release for prison prisoners. Um, so today we're joined by Martin Jones. He is chief executive of the parole board and has been for a number of years in his tenure. He's overseen significant changes in the parole board, parole board rules, um, practice policies, and of course the opening up of the parole system. Now the reason we're starting this podcast is primarily as a result of the coronavirus and the impact it's had on prisons. The prisoners so far have had their voice curtailed. Um, the real message around how pris prisoners are being affected by coronavirus hasn't really come to the forefront and we thought now that we have more time in the fact that neither of us are traveling very much anymore because parole hearings are remote we would take the additional time we have to get this podcast underway now john i mentioned a moment ago that um, the parole landscape has changed significantly quite clearly that was as a result of the case of war boys but would you like to briefly just summarize how you think it's changed well, the case of War Boys was plainly the subject of, of immense media and public scrutiny. I suspect up until War Boys, the parole process had been relatively quiet and just running in the background, if you like. Uh, and very few of the public uh, were, were aware of the process and, and, and what goes on behind the scenes. War Boys caused questions to be asked, quite understandably. And we've seen in recent years, a drive to be far more open and transparent. But we equally seen um, a need for, for a more effective review mechanism of parole board decisions. And that's the real um, thing that Martin Jones has been extremely involved in. I'll be interested in hearing from him today about it, in fact, it is how that review mechanism is, is working in practice. I think it's fair to say that across the wide range of parole board members that they truly value their independence and they have a, a significant depth of experience in assessing the future risk and risk to the public. I think one of the things for me that gets misconstrued by the media and the public is that liberal parole members are releasing all manner of people and in actual fact, for us on the ground, we, we know the true reality and that it's very hard to have people released on the, the, um, the risk test. And that in, in many cases, release and progression to open conditions is refused. For me today, what I'd like to discuss with Martin is his view of the independence of the parole board, particularly in light of the case of War Boys and the Wakenshaw case, which um, we'll cover in some detail later on. But um, for, for me, um, one of the things that was missed by the public and the media following the case of War Boys was that the decision itself in War Boys wasn't quashed on the basis of irrationality of decision itself, but rather the failure to consider material that the court thought should have been in the dossier but wasn't. 
and the Secretary of State did his level best at the time, Mr Gork, to put the blame on the parole board. But of course, the Secretary of State, as we well know, is responsible for the production of the dossier and for all the reports that are put into it. That, of course, was, was one of the most frustrating things that we've seen uh, in the recent high profile case of Wendell Baker, where the Secretary of State wasn't represented at all. Yeah, and I think that was highlighted very well in the recent Wendell Baker case, where the Secretary of State made a lot of noise after the decision seeking to score, in my view, political points, but didn't take an active role before the Pro Board considered the case, or indeed um, during, during, cynically. The Secretary of State seems happy to push the blame onto the parole board. We had the whole situation following the War Boys decision. Um, pressure was put on the chairman of the parole board then, Nick Hardwick, to resign. There was the issue around the lack of independence. That was involved in the Wakenshaw case where Swain took a high court challenge to the high court. Um, arguing that the Secretary of State had interfered with the independence of the parole board in the way they forced him to resign. And, of course, the court made that declaration. Now, one of the main things that came out of that case for me in terms of the evidence was Nick Hardwick continually made the point that when he was invited to a private meeting with the Justice Secretary, the Justice Secretary was very clear in saying, you must resign, and on a number of occasions said, don't make me get macho on you. Now, that, for me, that was very curious, and we, we pleaded that as part of the case. And at no point did the Secretary of State contest or challenge the fact that he made that. And now every time I um, see comments from Mr Gork in the media or on social media, I often think of the 80s, I think it was the village people, um, macho, macho man song. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's rather reminiscent, if you like, of the 80s song by, by the village people, I think, isn't it? Either that or the famous WWF wrestler, Macho Man Randy Savage. I can't get that image out of my head now you've mentioned it. So joining us in just a moment is Martin Jones, the Chief Executive of the Parole Board. He's been with the Parole Board for a number of years now and has overseen the significant developments in the Parole Board as an organisation. Martin. Thanks for joining us today to the first of many prison law pods here at Swain and Co. Solicitors. Hello. Hello, are you all right? Afternoon, Hello. Martin. So, yeah, you're, you're actually going to be our first guest in our first ever podcast series episode. Um, Fantastic. It's, it's something we thought about, we uh, thought that we'd get up and running. It's just taken a little longer than, than we thought. But we thought, of course, um, who would be a better guest than yourself? <laughs> Hope I don't let a side down now. <laughs> um, you've, you've, I think you've met John once before at a at a user group meeting. He was a one-off attender, but this is John Turner. Um, Hi, John. Um, oh, yeah, yeah we might probably bump into a big guy there in APL meetings and stuff. I think, yeah. you, I think you've seen each other at a couple of APL. Yeah, days. and um, we, we were going to take it in stages. Um, in terms of, obviously... Towards the end of March, the parole system changed quite dramatically. From a from the parole board's perspective, has the has the changes um, away from in person hearings impacted on release rates in any way? Um, we're monitoring it very closely. Um, and my concern slightly was that it would impact upon the confidence of members uh, making these decisions. Uh, we're monitoring them so far and actually the number of percentage of people being released is remaining pretty constant compared to what we'd ordinarily see. Uh, our release rate for more hearings is running at about 50%. We are finding quite a significant number of cases which are concluding on the papers ahead of the hearing, um, which I think is quite surprising. I was really worried that we'd find that the number of releases directed by the Pro Board would fall over this period. Whereas actually we're finding uh, the numbers are pretty much where we would expect them to be. Uh, the one area that we're trying to make some further progress on is on determinate recall cases, where I think there is an opportunity to try to accelerate some of those cases much more quickly. And is the parole board monitoring the remote hearing outcomes at all? Yeah, so we are. So we are looking at weekly data 
uh, showing us how many release decisions there are, how many open recommendations there are, um, and how many knockbacks there are. Um, I think it would be fair to say that the actual number of releases, uh, percentage of releases up by probably one or two percentage points, uh, which is good. Um, the one area where I've noticed some changes of behaviour uh, is probably around recommendations for open conditions, and it seems to me there has been a bit of a drop in recommendations for open, and I suspect that is probably due to the fact that with the coronavirus restrictions, um, movement within the estate is potentially a bit more difficult if you're making an open recommendation. So whether that means people are perhaps being released rather than necessarily um, just simply going through the motions of putting them for open, there could be a bit of that going on. What I'm also not clear about is whether some of the recommendations are changing um, as a result of COVID-19. It was very positive that immediately following the decision to suspend in-person hearings, the board was able to quickly switch to telephone hearings. And over the last few weeks, we've seen an increase in the use of video hearings. Um, one of the earlier concerns um, from the board itself was the number of licenses and the ability to ramp up the use of video hearings. Has this Secretary of State now given our greater number of licenses? Uh, yeah, so the numbers are increasing. So initially in the first few weeks, we only had the ability to hold two video hearings at any moment in time. Now, given the fact that Pro Board ordinarily lists six to 700 oral hearings a month, that clearly is not going to meet demand. Um, we've now, I think, got six to eight uh, hearings operating at any moment in time. And we've asked um, to increase that number to hold 25 hearings a time. So that would enable us to be concluding probably somewhere in the region of uh, 150 hearings via video each each week, um, which I think is much more indicative of where we would want to go to. Our view would be that uh, the system should be able to hold as many remote video hearings as possible. Uh, interestingly, though, and one thing that I think is worth stressing, I, I think telephone hearings have been much more effective than we'd expected. And I certainly think there is something, if you actually boil down a parole hearing to what it's about, the, the real question is ensuring fairness of proceeding so the prisoner can provide input and, and their own voice into the, into the process but also it should be there as an opportunity for the panel to ask questions um, and one of the things that has been suggested to me we've actually got a, a member of the parole board who's blind so all of her evidence she receives orally and she's perfectly good at making a risk assessment i, I think sometimes think the, su the suspicions that you need to look on see the look on somebody's face when they're answering a question i think that could be full of all sorts of potentially prejudicious material if you're sort of judging you know the look on somebody's face as they're answering a question I think you've got to do it based on the dossier and, and based on the evidence you receive not perhaps um, how somebody looks so I think it's, that's very dangerous as a precedent. Yeah I would certainly agree with that I think from my own perspective the reason I was asking around the use of video hearings is because um, from a number of the telephone hearings I was involved with the, the quality wasn't that good and um, a couple of mine had to be adjourned part heard because certain witnesses couldn't hear etc but the video hearings have been working very well um, so the parole board often whenever there's a media worthy decision to release comes in for a lot of criticism from members of the public and um, sections of the government is it fair to say that the serious rates of reoffending remains under 1%? That's, that's right, Dean. I mean, given the fact that, and it's a bit counterintuitive probably for the public, um, obviously the parole board only look at people who have committed very serious offences um, or people that have been recalled to custody because there's a concern that they may represent a risk to the public. But actually, our serious reoffending rate over a number of years is less than 1%. And indeed, the number of people that are convicted of a serious further offence after a parole release is running pretty consistently at half a percentage point. So those are really tiny numbers. Um, and actually, you know, the way that I describe it is actually, frankly, like looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, generally speaking, like, even when you review the cases where something has gone significantly wrong in the community, uh, quite often it's not predictable uh, that that would, would happen. And I think it shows that the system is pretty cautious in its decision making and I'm sure everybody working in the, in the prison law um, community would accept that is you know I don't think the parole board is 
you know, incredibly, um, you know, gauche in its approach to, to risk assessment. You know, these are serious decisions um, and we take them with great care. But of course, the one thing that we still do not have um, until it's invented is a crystal ball. Um, you can't see into the future in relation to what the future may hold. I think overall probable decision making is very good. Um, but also crucially uh, for me, the thing that is little understood is the fact that having a parole board there as an independent body making a court-like decision, we're ensuring that people are only lawfully kept in custody where they continue to represent a risk to the public. They should not be kept in there in prison for punishment. Um, our part of it is solely focused on risk. Um, and of course, there'll be many, many people that we see that you know, have caused deep harm uh, to victims. And we understand that, but that is not the role of the parole board. The role of the parole board is to look at future risk. Are there going to be new victims created if we release that individual? And all the statistics would demonstrate that we're very good at that decision. And it's, it's fair to say, isn't it, that our, our parole system compares favourably to um, par parole systems across the globe, if we think to the USA, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, for instance, um, the rates of release and the serious rate of reoffending is comparable? Absolutely, Dean. I mean, there is an international forum on, on this. Certainly the two things that are really clear from that is um, we have got a fair parole system. I certainly think we're much fairer than, um, I mean, there are some parts of the, uh, of the world where you will hold, you know, 20 to 25 parole hearings a day. Um, I seriously doubt that that is actually any kind of hearing. That's probably an opportunity for somebody to say a few words to a parole panel, uh, you know, begging them for a release. I don't think that's the way I would want to design our system. So we do try to be as fair as we possibly can be. And the results at the end of it show that we are, you know, as good as any system in the world um, on, our, on our decision making. And you, you interestingly made the point there that the, the, the tests for the board obviously relates to um, future risk and risk of serious harm. Um, one of the Air, concerning areas for many uh, prison practitioners is the sheer number of recalls that from experience primarily for compliance as opposed to further criminal offending or risk of serious harm is is the board um, concerned with that in any way the, is the board noticing that the majority of referrals appear to be for compliance related reasons so certainly on recall the, the rate at which the recall population has increased in recent years, I think is astonishing. Um, and uh, I certainly think it's an area that people need to keep focusing on what are the reasons um, for that. We know that in recent years, the probation service has been overstretched at times, given obviously the very significant reforms underway um, uh, within the probation service. But I do think all of those recall decisions should be about risk of serious harm to the public in the future, not um, because somebody has missed a curfew time. Um, I, I also think that sometimes, I think the real difficulty on recall is you can understand why a probation officer who um, has doesn't know the whereabouts of a serious offender whilst on licence may be worried about what is going on. But of course, what you quite often find is something has gone wrong, but it doesn't go to risk. But once you've made that recall decision, it's too late. You can't rescind that recall decision. It has to then go into the parole system. That takes, you know, weeks, if not months, for us to make a decision. And I think some opportunity to keep that under review quite closely um, would be a good thing. Um, if you look at the number of people released by the parole board um, for a recall uh, parole hearing, it's about 60 to 65 percent. And that would indicate to me that quite a significant number of people that are recalled to custody do not represent a, a, a serious ongoing risk to the public. Um, and I think it's certainly something that we need to anxiously scrutinise. Do, do you think, just touching on anx anxious scrutiny, that's a very good um, way of putting it. Do you think that the, particularly for life sentence prisoners that are recalled, do you think the Secretary of State in taking the decision to recall gives proper anxious scrutiny? I think the problem that you quite often face on recall is that the gap between the reality of the front line in managing the situation and where the final recall decision is made is so wide that it, often it's the, the public protection casework section that make the final decision on recall. And they will decide that based on, you know, uh, 
a, a written application in essence to say this is what we understand is happening and this is the risk and of course that's away from the, the detailed understanding of what's going on on the ground with the probation officer um, I was very interested in the system in Scotland where in Scotland um, to recall an offender you have to apply to the parole board to recall the offender and oddly enough their recall numbers are nowhere near as high as they are in the United in England and Wales now I think there's something to learn from that in the basis of if instead of um, writing to the Secretary of State, the executive, to seek a recall decision, you had to apply to the parole board, maybe for us to make a decision in 48 hours, would that be a better system to ensure that that recall is really necessary? Uh, um, uh, again, looking internationally, many other international systems have an application process to the parole board, you know, if necessary, out of hours. I, I think that would probably control the numbers somewhat. Uh, that's certainly a very interesting proposition because um, a, a large proportion of my work at the moment is is representing recalled prisoners and one of the things that always amazes me is that the point that the parole board are asked to take a decision on the papers there'll be at least one report from the probation service but often the evidential base setting out why the person's been recalled is very limited for instance um, there's a there's a box on the form have alternatives to recall been considered but very rarely does it it's ticked but very rarely does it set out what those are and if you've had a lifer for instance in the community for three or four years living in his own accommodation um, being recalled for compliance related reasons you often wonder why they couldn't have put the person in an approved premises for a period of time to further test them as opposed to just recalling them and then having to go through a, a lengthy process. I, I'm, I'm sure that's right Dean and I, and I think um, certainly in looking at making you know obviously once you recall somebody to custody that is a significant disruptor to jobs accommodation and all the support ties in the community now we know that the rate of serious offending is is tiny and, and obviously you know and I can appreciate the fact I think everybody appreciates the fact that obviously there is always a risk of it going badly wrong in the community and, we, and we've seen that but my own view is you've got to be able to trust the decision making of professionals to judge you know, when there is really significant increasing risk versus concerns about simply compliance in the community. And in reality, quite often what you see with recall is people that perhaps have started to struggle in the community and need more support. But the second that then, I mean, I often hear when I speak to, to, to people in the community, people saying, you know, I'm scared of being recalled. If you're scared of being recalled, how open and honest with your probation officer are you going to be about telling them that a relationship has broken down telling them that you're worried about your job, telling them that you're worried about money if you think that you're going to ask for help and then get recalled to custody. And I think there's something counterintuitive in that. My instinct is if you could have greater trust out there, you probably could keep people in the, keep people in the community for longer and give them the help that they need. But if they're worried about recall being used in an overly punitive way, I think you destroy that trust in some of those relationships. Excellent. Um, over to you, John. Yeah, um, thank you. J just following on, really, on, on the issue, um, or some of the issues, rather, that Dean's identified, how, how are the board handling cases where the individual involved particularly wants an oral hearing, uh, and when I say an oral hearing, a face-to-face -face oral hearing? Uh, the reasons for that can be, there can be various reasons for it, a fear of the technology for, for older lifers, um, some of them want their day in court for want of, better, want of a better way of putting it, uh, and some feel it's just fairer. H has the board seen people requesting a face-to-face -face hearing? And if so, how are the board dealing with it? Are, are we expected to provide a rationale for why a face-to-face -face hearing is needed uh, above a remote hearing, for example? Yeah, thank you, John. I think that's a really interesting and really fundamental question. Uh, to how we're proceeding on, on this. I mean, my instinct is that certainly in the first weeks, and I know, uh, uh, you know, Dean and you were involved in those early discussions in relation to what we were going to do when we were forced into the position of pausing face-to-face uh, -face hearings at that point in time. We didn't really know how long that position would last for. Um, I think in those first few weeks, you know, we were probably living a little bit hand-to-mouth in relation to actually working out exactly what the structures would be. Um, generally speaking, the way that it's operating now is that the panel chair is taking a provisional view 
on a case in terms of will it be suitable uh, for be determined uh, in a, a remote way. But in all cases, we should be asking the prisoner um, and the prisoner's legal representative for their views. And if there are views, they should, of course, be taken into account in the final decision on that. I certainly have seen and I've been looking at some adjournment notices where it has been adjourned uh, for a face to face hearing. And a number of those have been where the prisoner themselves have come back and say, you know, actually, I, I don't want my case and my liberty to be determined uh, on a telephone hearing uh, or on a video hearing. And some of it is, I think, about trust. I think the other problem that you sometimes have is probably building confidence. And I wonder now that we've actually got and um, we've had more than a thousand hearings now taking place via remote means. I do think we need to ensure that we communicate the messages on fairness that actually the release rate has remained pretty constant actually. I think that will probably improve a prisoner's confidence. They will feel they'll get a fair hearing. Um, if, it, if this was the 17th of March, I think I might have been sitting on the fence a, a little bit as part of that. The other thing that we are very conscious of is there are some prisoners with vulnerabilities that will mean this is very difficult. So I've certainly seen cases which have been adjourned because prisoner has hearing difficulties, prisoner has mental health difficulties or other needs that means that it would be very difficult for them to have an effective hearing without somebody to support them through that process. I think what the board is now looking to do is identify those cases where we do really need a face-to-face -face hearing and how we can restart those in a safe way that keeps all the participants, including the prisoner, uh, safe as part of that, so that we don't put them at a risk of in infection with COVID-19. But actually, if you look at it and you look at some prisons, I think with a little imagination, you probably could find a way of running an effective hearing, perhaps with fewer people in the room, but with enough people that the prisoner does have a voice. So um, certainly we've been talking to members about potentially having a hearing, certainly a single member panel, uh, maybe a, a slightly larger room, and there are always larger rooms available in prison if you look hard enough maybe with the lawyer and, the, and other people perhaps giving evidence by remote means. I think that could work um, in some of those cases, um, provided that you think it through quite carefully and you think about what the controls are. But fairness to the prisoner must be, you know, um, a, a vital part of this, that we can't ride roughshod over their rights when many of these people will have been waiting, you know, many, many, many years indeed for their parole hearing and then simply saying, well, OK, then, you know, you're going to have one shot on a, t at a telephone. You can see why they might be nervous about it, even if the results show that actually overall the results are, um, you know, are not far off what we'd ordinarily expect. Thank you. Um, I'd like also to talk, if I can, about the, the reconsideration mechanism uh, and what's happened since that was introduced, and in particular um, decisions being provisional for 21 days. Do you feel that since the introduction of that mechanism, um, there's been an impact on the perception of independence? Um, I, I'd like to think um, that actually over the last couple of years, the board has asserted its independence a little bit more perhaps than it has in the past. Certainly, my own view is that we need to act like a court um, when we're making these decisions. And actually, in spite of the fact that sometimes our decisions can be unpopular with parliamentarians and the media, I think that makes it even more important that we explain our reasons. One of the things that I like about the reconsideration mechanism, and you've seen it in some recent cases, is you can spell out exactly why the parole board has made the decisions that it, that it does. Um, uh, in some of the recent cases where there's been reconsideration applications, the board has been able to crystallise the fact that all of the report writers um, had agreed that this person was a very low risk. And so some of the alarmist reports that you see in the media almost can be dispelled by publishing our reasons for reconsideration. Um, so my own view is certainly given the, uh, the difficulties that we faced a couple of years ago now, we shouldn't be afraid of that further scrutiny so that there is a, a check um, on, on the decisions that we make. But we need to be very clear that the, decision, the reconsideration mechanism is based on judicial review. Um, and therefore there is a high bar to be jumped to succeed. Um, but if you look at the numbers, the majority of applications that have succeeded have been from prisoners, uh, not from the Secretary of State. Um, I think by an overwhelming majority, which indicates probably uh, if you are to criticise the decisions of the parole board, you'd probably say that actually we are unnecessarily keeping people in custody rather than releasing people too early. Um, I guess that would be one of the things that I would look at. I think in the long term, you might want to look at 
uh, whether you could provide a proper appeals, a statutory appeals mechanism uh, from a parole board decision, but that would require primary legislation to do it at the moment. I think reconsideration provides a sort of a, a workable way forward, which I think probably, given the fact that we're not afraid of um, um, refusing a Secretary of State's application, I think that's a good thing. That's what you'd expect from a call. You referred there to, to the vast majority of these uh, reconsideration requests being made by the prisoner themselves, but recently we've seen the Secretary of State um, activate it in a number of media-worthy cases, you might say. Is it right to do that in cases where um, they've often chosen or, or nearly always choose now not to be represented at the hearing? Um, I, I think the, the difficulty that the Secretary of State faces uh, when putting forward an application where you've had no previous involvement, it makes it very hard to set out a, a strong case for reconsideration because um, obviously the panel has to make its decision based on the evidence it receives at the hearing. And if it he or hears and sees in the dossier overwhelming support uh, for a decision in a particular direction, how could it possibly you know, make a reasoned judgment to go in a different direction? And I think that's the real difficulty is if the Secretary of State really feels strongly that a particular individual should not be released, well, he needs to make his case to say that. You can't do it after the event. Um, I, I think that makes it extremely difficult indeed to make a reconsideration decision as part of that. And of course, it is true of particularly high profile cases where you can see that, um, you know, the possibility of the media getting very interested in. You can see how sometimes victims get terribly upset by our decisions. And we understand that. But if there are strong feelings and strong representations that go to risk, they should be brought to the attention of the parole board at the hearing rather than after the event. Um, and I, I guess my view is the reconsideration decisions that I've seen so far make that very clear in very plain legal language normally laid down by a retired High Court judge to say actually you know if, if you want a particular decision you need to argue for that decision you can't sort of just cross your fingers and hope the parole board will um, go in a different direction than the evidence and um, all of our decisions must be based on the evidence so if somebody is assessed as being a low to limited risk, you shan't be surprised when the parole board releases them. It was encouraging to, to hear, um, I think it was his honour, Judge Saunders, um, say something very similar to that um, in, the, in the Wendell Baker case that's been talked about a lot recently. Um, I'm interested now just to, to determine, does the Secretary of State, does he, does he notify the board? Um, if, if a recommendation for open conditions is, is going to be rejected? Uh, yeah, so we hear um, and we get a written notification after that decision is taken of the reasons why the Secretary of State has not agreed with our recommendations. Um, the way that I would describe it is surely it's a matter of courtesy. You send the case to the parole board for us to make a decision and our decision is to recommend open conditions. But if the Secretary of State doesn't accept that recommendation, he needs to tell us why, um, surely. And, and how is that? How is that monitored? Um, really, just looking at at the impact that it would have on on the independence of the board. So we are monitoring it quite closely. It's, it's relatively small volumes. I think it's about um, fifteen to twenty cases a year when um, the secretary of state does not accept our recommendations. I know it's an area which has a high potential to attract judicial review in relation to the reasonableness of um of the secretary of state's decision on this i uh, so we feed all of those um decisions uh, back to the original panel so that we can understand that and we certainly look at it in relation to our guidance and practice i do think you need to take a long-term view of this though because of course if the parole board you know on on the second review recommends somebody for open um, based, uh, as I said before, quite often on all of the evidence of the report writers, some of whom will quite often be recommending release and the parole board perhaps goes with uh, a recommendation broken instead. What is the panel to do when it reviews the case again? Um, are you to second guess the Secretary of State's decision and say, well, is it worth us recommending open if the Secretary of State is going to reject it again? Should we simply release the individual instead? And I think that's certainly something that I think um, needs to be considered when you're looking at rejections of recommendations for open because ultimately the parole board is there to determine whether imprisonment continues to be necessary for the protection of the public clearly uh, testing in open conditions provides you know some good evidence to support that decision making but if you're not going to be allowed to 
direct that, then um, uh, certainly I, I think um, panels shouldn't be afraid of, of uh, releasing people. Thanks. Um, certainly in recent years, we've seen the Pro Board take significant steps in improving um, public awareness of, of, of its work and of the system in, in, in general. Do you have a view about how we may go even further, potentially involving the media and the public attending hearings, if, if and when appropriate? My own view, certainly over the last couple of years, is we have got nothing to, to, to worry about in relation to transparency. We've got nothing to hide. Um, I know the people on this call have sat through hundreds of parole hearings. Um, I think for the most part, um, if you managed to see, the public could see what we did on a widespread basis, there'd be greater confidence in our decision making. You'd see this was a thorough process. Um, I think the biggest concern I would have about, you know, just opening the whole system up would be there are some incredibly sensitive details um, disclosed in parole hearings in individual cases, particularly information about prisoners and their mental health, their childhoods and all the things that perhaps have led to them being in prison. Uh, and I don't think it's necessarily necessary for all of that information to be in the public domain. I think it's a very sensitive information as part of that. Um, also information sometimes about victims, which I, I think we need to be quite careful about. But having said that, I would not have an objection to certain cases, you know, being broadcast. You know, if there's a strong public interest in these things, you know, if you, if you want to go to the old Bailey, um, perhaps not at the moment, you know, you can sit for a criminal trial and you can see how, how justice is conducted. You can go to the High Court and see justice being conducted. I think that's a good thing about, about a justice system, which you allow people to see justice um, being done. Um, and for many of the parole hearings that I've sat through, I'm, I, I would certainly think I would have no objection at all uh, to a journalist um, sitting through that or indeed a member of the public. I think you need to ensure you get some professional distance. Um, the Parole Board is looking um, later this year to be developing a documentary focused entirely on the Parole Board, which will broadcast on the BBC. I think that will shine a real light on the system. You need to be careful about some of the information, but um, I think increasing um, awareness of the work that we do and the, and the way in which we approach that decision making would increase public confidence. Thank you. I'll pass back to Dean now. Martin, one of the issues I think all practitioners can see at the moment is you know, for hearings kind of listed maybe August, September time, that reports directed to be produced may not necessarily be prepared. So, um, for instance, obviously the prison psychology service, as a result of the lockdown, were effectively removed from the prison estate. And at the moment on the ground, it seems there's very limited psychology assessments being prepared. Um, and obviously that's going to have a knock on effect on the ability of members to hear cases in, in the uh, forthcoming months. Has the MOJ informed the parole board of its plans to ensure that directions will continue to be complied with in a timely manner or as timely as possible? So it is certainly something which is being um, has been taken up with the ministry at the highest possible levels. Certainly, there's been a letter to the Secretary of State for Justice uh, about this, highlighting our concerns to ensure that the reports and, in particular, the psychological assessment and other interventions um, are progressed in, in this period. I mean, I can understand, you know, as, as anybody can, that there is going to be an element of disruption given the fact that you know the world has had to change in a very short period of time. But my, my challenge, as with the Pro Board, is how do you find a way of working around this? And I think uh, with the right desire and the right technology support, I think you can find ways of doing um, proper assessments in this period um, in a way that is safe. And sometimes it may require, for example, a change to the guidance. So I can understand why in ordinary circumstances, you know, psychological risk assessments and interviews should be conducted face to face. Um, well, clearly, um, if it may be a period of, you know, six months before we can return to a proper face-to-face -face assessment, you, you've got to find a way of, of working around that in the short term. Certainly, my, um, my message is to the top of HMPPS um, is that they, they have to find a way of getting this to work um, and finding ways of getting those cases to progress. Because as I said at the moment, uh, the parole board continues to progress prisoners 
um, at the rate that we have had now, we've been releasing probably 250, 260 people a month, which is a, a relatively healthy number. My worry would be that the numbers would drop in six months' time mm. for all of the reasons that you said. We'd actually we'll get a, get cases on, and the risk assessments haven't been done, um, the interventions haven't been done, and that's my bigger long-term worry about the um, operation of the system. And then what is the problem to do um, in that circumstance if it's got you know perhaps a less than good um, view of the risk presented in those individual cases? I, I think that would be a, a real shame. I mean, in, interestingly, on a couple of cases that I've been dealing with, well, for, for the majority of cases I've been dealing with, we've been able to continue having externally commissioned psychological reports and assessments completed via the use of um, telephone and video link um, appointments with prisoners. And very interestingly, a couple of parole members have actually in in, res in responses to requests by the Secretary of State made it very clear that um, they should be looking at using um, technology to continue and in fact the British Psychological Society has just issued guidelines for um, psychology assessments being conducted remotely so it'll be interesting to see how the Secretary of State proceeds with that. Um, up until the beginning of this month the Secretary of State hadn't really released any guidance as to how prisons would um, start to relax restrictions on an individual basis, depending on the number of cases of COVID they had. Um, is, the, is the parole board being appraised of the Ministry of Justice plans at all? Um, for the reasons we've just really discussed, the um, psychology assessments, running offending behaviour programmes, legal visits, but of course, um, I guess most importantly for the board is the timing of any future in-person hearings in each establishment is determined on an individual prison approach. So is, is the MOJ keeping the board appraised of its plans or has it been kept largely in the dark like the rest of us? So uh, I think it'd be fair to say that we're aware of the sort of strategic plan for restarting cases um, and there is a commitment that the prison service will start to work with the board to work out when face-to-face -face hearings are going to restart at a particular set of prisons. When I talked earlier about identifying um, cases where there really is a need um, for a face-to-face -face hearing to ensure a fair hearing, we are now starting those conversations on an individual establishment level to say, you know, at prison X, you know, we've now got a vulnerable prisoner, he needs a face-to-face -face hearing, it's currently scheduled for July. How can we make that happen? Talking to the prison, talking to the lawyer, talking to the other parties about that. So we come up with a very much bespoke arrangement. Now, my suspicion is if in July, maybe we have 10 of those hearings taking place that are actually you know, viable and worthwhile, we will get some really helpful material to inform the development of those plans. Because my own view is that you can get it to work. I sat through a video hearing um, about a month ago now for what I would describe as a relatively elderly prisoner. Um, he was certainly fairly deep into his 60s. And if he'd been sitting in the room on his own, he would have really struggled to have coped um, with the hearing. But he had uh, his offender supervisor in the room, appropriately distanced, and you could hear her off camera explaining things to him to ensure that he understood what was going on. And it was a fair parole hearing, and he got a release decision two days later. But I think if it had been sitting in the room on his own, I think there was a risk that that hearing could have been adjourned or deferred because you could hear in his voice and some of the things that he was muttering that he wasn't comfortable with the technology. And, you know, the classic thing, you know, you've all seen it on these on these sort of calls. You know, there was a little bit of delay on some of the lines, people talking over each other. And you could see his concern was, I'm not getting a fair hearing. Um, and you need to ensure that people are supported and reassured that there is a fairness in the process you know, running through all the parties and in particular, you know, allowing the legal rep at the end of the hearing an opportunity to speak to him to ensure that he was happy. Um, I think it was probably helped by the fact that she certainly, you, you, by the end of the hearing, I, I knew pretty much where the decision was going and that probably helped with the assurances at the end of that. But I think something you need to be, you know, extremely careful about to ensure that there is fairness. Mm. What about the, the approach to those in open conditions in the sense that, um, John and I have both recently been working with a number of open establishments trying to ensure that um, rottles are, are, are given to, 
to those with hearings um, that are fairly imminent. But it seems to be the consensus that um, rottles are, we're, we're not really going to be looking at overnight leaves until next year um, for, for a different reason. Some, some because they've got active cases of COVID. Others, on the flip side, they haven't got any and they don't want to allow people out mixing in the community in case they bring any um, bring COVID into the establishment. Is, is the board looking at alternative ways to assess risk for those in open conditions or, or is it likely to be the case in the absence of rottles, the hearings be put off? I think this is an area where we need to do some joint work actually with all the parties drawing in the Association of Prison Lawyers um, and the Open Estate. Uh, I think there's all sorts of evidence you can get from um, time in open conditions and release on temporary license is one of them. But of course, there are other things that you can learn from that period. And I think it's important that you take a rounded view of that evidence. The other thing is, interestingly, I, I, I sometimes think that the board should take a wider view of, um, you know, what I hope is that in six months time, when you're reviewing somebody that's been in open during this period, you could see for some prisoners why they might be saying, well, why don't I take a walk, actually, um, and give myself, um, you know, a, a, a bit of time on my own. Now, prisoners that do the right thing, and comply with the rules and do so responsibly, should get some credit um, for the way in which they've behaved uh, during this very difficult time. I think that would be a good thing um, to happen. But I certainly think we need to find a way of testing what can be done um, in this very difficult period. Um, you know, I, I, even if it's, you know, um, finding a way of, you know, um, getting a getting a town visit in some way, you know, with an appropriate face covering. Um, I still think you should be really sort of testing this because ultimately I, it would be very, you know, very poor, poor business to me if we end up finding that people are kept in prison for a, a, a significantly greater length of time merely because um, of the COVID restrictions. It needs to be proportionate to the risk that you're managing, um, I, I think. Um, and certainly I would be um, seeking to persuade people to try to use a bit of imagination in this time. So looking to the future with your crystal ball in your hand, when would you say, you, at your best guess, do you think you'll be, uh, will be in a position to allow members and legal reps back into prison um, to do face-to-face -face hearings? That's a, that is a million-dollar question, isn't it, <laughs> Dean? I... I strongly, strongly suspect that it is going to be uh, 2021 before the new normal probably emerges. What I'm hoping is that as we get into the autumn time, an increased percentage of cases will start to proceed. The other difficulty is, and you know, and you know this, is some of the uh, members of the parole board um, are of an age which would themselves make them vulnerable um, in going in. And that was the first time this hit us. Uh, in early March was when we realised that a number of our members would need to be shielded merely by nature of their of their age and other vulnerabilities that they have. So clearly, I need to ensure that I safeguard those people. Um, but actually, you know, what I'm hoping is that we do find a way of reintroducing, you know, substantive face-to-face -face hearings in that period, but also that we don't forget the lessons that we do learn from this period in relation to, you know, where remote hearings are workable and they are working. If they allow us to improve the system, we should do that. And I'm very, very interested in relation to how we might do recall cases differently in the future. And if that enabled us to put on much quicker uh, hearings uh, for people that are recalled to custody, I think that would be a good thing. And I'm sure everybody would want to work with us, provided, of course, that we provide a fair um, hearing in that way that enables them to, uh, prisoners to put in their representations properly uh, as part of that. But I'd certainly like to be in a position where perhaps we could offer somebody, you know, a remote hearing on a recall case within maybe six weeks, um, rather than at the moment, it's three or four months. And by that time, how much of your sentence you got left? It's lousy. Um, we need to do better than that, I think. Yeah. I think my, uh, my, <laughs> my final observation just relates to a case that I had recently where it was a telephone hearing and the, the two parole board members forgot that the client had remained in the room and no one from the prison had actually turned the link off. So he was able to phone me and tell me what his decision was before, uh, before the end of the afternoon. <laughs> I think that led to the best practice guidance going out from the board to members relatively shortly thereafter, Dean. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Well, 
Martin, uh, thanks very much for giving us your time this afternoon. We really appreciate it. That's a pleasure. No, always, um, thank you very much indeed. Well, that was a very interesting interview with Martin. I think we can uh, safely say that he was very candid with his responses and we hope that has been useful for everyone listening. Would you agree, John? I would. I think, if anything, Dean, he, he gave us more uh, than we possibly expected. He was extremely open. What, what certainly struck me was the parole board appeared to be geared up for this to, to run and run. Um, he indicated throughout the course of that interview that they're geared up for this to run into next year in, in some way. It, it's noticeable for me that the parole board really do appear to be doing everything they can to keep the system running and and keep it moving. The worry, of course, is that the prison and probation service are, are taking a slightly different attitude. Um, and they they could arguably be said to have shut up shop a little bit more to, to control the spread of the virus. And there's a concern from me, at least, that the system is, is starting to move very slowly or, or, or could it could be considered to have ground to a halt. And that's one of the concerns that Swain and Co has as a firm. We're doing all we can to assist people at this time to deal with some of these issues. We've submitted a significant number of letter before claims on the very uh, react on the very point of the reaction to the coronavirus and the pandemic within individual prisons, how that impacts on long term solitary confinement, Article Eight, and all manner of issues to keep the parole system ticking over. It's um, it was very really interesting, I think, that Martin raised the point of the crystal ball and future risk. And sometimes, certainly from my perspective, it, it's, it appears like that in, in the course of a hearing. And I think sometimes some of the witnesses um, try to heavily speculate when, in real terms, what they're doing, simply looking into a crystal ball. It was also interesting, I think, to, to hear Martin talking about the possible lessons that we can learn from what's going on during the crisis. And I was interested that it's given him pause to, to think about perhaps introducing remote hearings on a, on a wider basis. He talked of trying to get recalls considered quicker um, via remote hearings. I think that would be something that would be welcome to us as practitioners. Um, and it, it would certainly be of interest to our clients because there are quite a number of recalls in particular that sit there for many months waiting in effect to be released when the case could have been considered far quicker. There's certainly very interesting times ahead and we at Swain and Co remain as committed as ever to ensure prisoners rights are protected. That brings our first podcast to an end and um, we'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We hope to be back very soon. And we hope on the next occasion to be speaking to Phil Wheatley, former Director General of the National Offender Management Service, NOMS, and also the Director General, or former Director General rather, of the uh, Prison Service. We'll be talking to him about some of the issues that, that flow out of today's podcast, um, and in particular the response of prison and probation services um, to, to the virus and indeed uh, look towards the future and how and what we're going through at, at this present time um, may may influence what the what the services look like in the future. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we'll see you very soon. Swain and Co. Podcasts.